Uh, hello, my name is uh, Jay Henry. I'm laboratory director for the Utah Department of Public Safety Crime Laboratory. And today I'm going to talk about sexual assault kits and uh, what we have in them, what the laboratories, laboratories test, and really kind of the mindset behind the sample selection criteria and uh, our entire approach to looking at uh, sexual assault kits. Uh, this is a presentation that I gave about a year ago at the National Sex Assault Symposium in, uh, in 2016 in Washington, D.C. So what I'm doing today is just taking that same information and, and putting it into this webinar. So uh, the first thing about uh, Sex Assault Kit is that um, one of the questions I often is of the crime laboratory is just, can you just test the kit? And so what I like to do is is kind of break that kit apart to take a look at what's inside it um, and as you can see on the left you see a a box and the box um, is if you can think of it it's kind of like a um, almost like a crime scene in a box and then on the right there's many samples there you've got uh, uh, various swabs and debris that might be collected from a kit so it's a lot more complex than I think people realize or or assume. So, what I've done here is put together, taken a, a a crime scene photo, and I think everybody who's maybe watched television shows um, can really appreciate this photo here. That you see the uh, crime scene in front of you and all of the different markers. And if you can envision it, each one of those markers. Uh, there being a, an item of physical evidence, be it a, a drop of blood or a fired casing or a cigarette butt or something like that. Everybody, I think, can see that and realize, wow, that is complex. There's a lot going on there. And so we use that same, I use this analogy that um, if we go back to that, that box on the right, you can see all those swabs. And so the swabs is really... Um, the what's collected from the victim um, and the the victim is if you can think of that as um, as as a crime scene and each one of those swabs is evidence collected from that victim so there's a lot going on here when people uh, want to test a a kit there's uh, a lot of thought and uh, a, a, a logical process is involved okay so first thing is when when the kid comes to the lab uh, what we do is we we read the kit report and that report on the right is a piece of paper that's filled out by the nurse and what the nurse is doing is interviewing the victim and trying to determine what happened um, and to the best of the, of the victim's recollection and we use that as kind of a starting point, using information to help guide us in selection of the most uh, relevant items for testing. And that'll help us focus our effort and our resource. So as a forensic scientist, uh, uh, I will go through and um, I will take a look at each one of those items, inventory it, what was collected, what wasn't collected, compare that to the report on the right, and see which samples should I begin with. So I've put together a couple bullet points, actually four bullet points here for you to uh, take a look at. And just uh, this is what the forensic scientist is doing. So this is the mindset of the forensic scientist. Again, these are just general concepts. The first is, um, you know, I, I know uh, individuals want to focus on testing the kit, but <clears throat> the, the forensic scientist is not really the first interest is not testing the kid it's actually solving the case and what I mean by that is we're trying to identify the putative perpetrator now I'm using a very strange term here putative um, and I use that because that's a FBI terminology uh, that's used to uh, describe the um, uh, uh, a, a, a sample that is um, put, placed into CODIS and CODIS is the combined DNA indexing system. That's the forensic DNA database. So I use putative, meaning the the individual that's most likely the suspect. 
Okay, so putative perpetrator. Because when you when you test a bunch of cases, uh, uh, samples in a case, you can come across samples that really aren't putative. They could be belong to the victim. They could be belong to the consensual sex partner. They could be belong to somebody else completely unrelated at the scene. So when we say putative perpetrator, we're really focusing on that person that is most likely to have committed the crime. And so, as I said, where our focus is solve the case, not necessarily test a sample. And so as we're going through those, those um, samples on the left there in that box, um, as we're going through that, we're going to evaluate each one of those samples. And we want to select those samples that are probative. And what we mean by probative is what sample will have an impact on our case. And as we're looking at that, what, what sample will give us the, the, the most information and hopefully uh, lead to the identification of the perpetrator. And uh, our third bullet point there talks about uh, how we start. Usually what we do is we'll start with the most intimate samples. So we're looking at, uh, in most cases, uh, the vaginal swaths because those are the most uh, intimate samples. So uh, if you have an attack, uh, sexual assault, um, that is uh, the, the probably the most critical piece of information that you that you can find and so we start with those intimate samples and then we expand as necessary and finally we only test samples needed to solve the case so we don't necessarily test every sample um, but only those needed to uh, develop a, a, a DNA profile and then take that DNA profile and upload it to the CODIS database or compare it directly to um, a suspect that uh, the police department may have. So um, if we start with the, the central part there and then we're going to move out to the vaginal swabs and uh, progress counterclockwise, uh, if we start with the vaginal swabs, uh, those are uh, manila envelopes with cardboard boxes and inside those cardboard boxes are um, swabs that are very similar to a Q-tip. Those swabbings are taken um, during the examination by the sexual assault nurse examiner, placed into a cardboard box. And with this, when the swabs uh, of the vagina, what they'll do is they'll pick up uh, uh, DNA from the, the victim, and they also pick up DNA from uh, the suspect, so sperm samples. Those are placed into a cardboard box and then uh, typically they'll be moist but the cardboard allows the 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 specimen to breathe uh, so release the moisture and then dry out and that's what we want to do. As long as those samples are placed into a, uh, a dried box they'll last for years and years um, and so because DNA is very hardy, um, sperm samples are very stable and so that's the ideal um, sample to, to, to collect. <clears throat> so moving counterclockwise, we'll go to the cervical swabs. Um, and uh, typically those samples are up in the cervix and they are probably the, the sample that will last the longest. That is the tend to be the most able to get a result. So if with a cervical swab, I think uh, research indicates that if um, there's a sample that uh, the attack uh, has occurred within five days that there's a chance that we can get a result within five days of that s with a cervical swab. Now some laboratories are taking it out to even nine days and that's, that's because technology continues to change our approach um, to this. Now uh, a profile that's developed after you know, uh, say four or five days or up to nine days probably not going to be a profile a DNA profile that you can put into the database, but it might be sufficient to uh, do a direct comparison to a potential suspect that that um, that the police may have um, have an interest in. So, um, but uh, the technology continues to expand. Cervical swabs are, are very useful in that uh, they allow us to to get a result um, pretty far out there, five to to nine days. That's that's really really good. Um, then anal swabs and rectal swabs. Uh, anal swab is just that um, area outside of the anus and uh, typically that can be uh, collected 
um, after an assault. Um, and unless there's been evidence of a rectal uh, assault, usually what the, the anal swab is, is just drains from the vagina into the, the anal area. But it is a swab that is collected and, uh, you know, can be um, useful um, if tested. Rectal swab um, are those that are inside the rectum and usually only collected if a, um, it, the attack indicates that uh, there was rectal penetration, ejaculation, or some damage in there. Um, we can uh, use that uh, swab to, you know, to, to help um, confirm uh, that particular si um, situation and or um, identify a perpetrator. Now, both those swabs uh, tend to have bacteria, and uh, so those samples tend to degrade the, the fastest, uh, but they are, uh, 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 we do give the nursing uh, facility the option to uh, collect those samples. Now, continuing around to oral swabs, um, we're back to, um, these are probably the least stable, only collected if there's indication of some sort of oral assault and probably not going to get anything less than um, greater than a day so eight hours to a day that's probably where you're you might pick something up uh, and hopefully just immediately after the attack okay so back to counterclockwise again if we start with the underpants um, as, as i had mentioned earlier we start with the most intimate samples first and, uh, and then we work our way out we're not going to test the underpants um, unless w the rest of the kit samples are negative, but um, but but the reason the underpants are of interest is because uh, drainage can occur from the vagina, from uh, the anal area, and the underpants represent a great way to collect some of that sample. And if um, the sample, um, uh, if that sample lands in the underpants and then dries, then it tends to, to stabilize it. So it is it is a good um, it is a good second resort. It's kind of our secondary area of collection, and so we like to um, to have that collected in the kit. Now we used to collect that separately, but we go ahead and place that in in the kit. And again, we're only going to test that if the vaginal swabs, anal swabs, and the other ones um, are negative. And then we discuss with the detective whether or not testing the other pants is, is uh, something that we ought to take a look at. Continuing counterclockwise, we see the penile swabs. Uh, these are for uh, male victims and or, um, so a swab would be taken of the uh, shaft of the penis uh, with the idea to um, collect evidence of the perpetrator um, on on the the male victim the other is uh, we collect penile swabs on suspects kits when we're trying to associate a, vi a victim uh, to um, a suspect's penis and then the next one is pubic combings this is a a, a place where we would um, um, comb the pubic area with the intention of picking up any any trace evidence so this would be any any hairs um, from the suspect and or uh, fibers or any debris that might be in the pubic area and so we use this as, as kind of a, a collect all type uh, situation now uh, a recent um, societal changes indicate that a lot of uh, victims now are, are shaved so there's not really a combing but we do ask that the nurses either swab that area or that they be aware that there could be some sort of debris in the in the pubic area and so if there's a hair or anything like that especially if it's um, if it's different from the victim uh, that we ask them to collect that sample and what we would do in that case, if we had a pubic hair or even a head hair in that area, we'd uh, we we would cut the the root off of that and then test that area uh, later down the line. But this the pubic combings, the penile swabs, the underpants, uh, they're kind of a secondary type of evidence that we test. They're not really primary. They're they're not our first ones up. They're kind of like a a catch-all. If we didn't get it the first time, let's go to the second tier of of evidence. Continuing 
counterclockwise, we get to the body stains. Now, body stains is a little bit different. It's not really a secondary type of stain. Depending on case circumstances, the, the body stain may be uh, tested along with the vaginal swabs and the rectal swabs. So, if the case report indicates that there is a, a lick mark or a bite mark or an ejaculate um, on the skin or that the victim was choked or there was some sort of grabbing, um, so some sort of contact, rough contact, where there's a good chance that the victim's skin cells, saliva, um, um, saliva or um, male ejaculate was left behind on on the victim's skin then we'll uh, ask that the nurse swab that particular area label it put it into the report and uh, make sure that that is brought to our attention because that'll be one of the swabs that we'll want to include along with uh, the vaginal swabs uh, or the more intimate swabs that uh, are uh, including that first tier of analysis I think forensic scientists in recent years have been very surprised when we started really taking a look at it, how often and um, that we're getting results from these body stain swabs. So we're very encouraged by that, uh, a little bit surprised by it, uh, that we're getting so many um, good results from that. And I think that's because of the change in the technology of the DNA kits, that we're able to get better, more accurate, and more... Um, and more sensitive results from these new DNA techniques. Uh, finishing up uh, on counterclockwise, we come to the fingernail swabs. These um, would be just um, swabbings from underneath the fingernails. And again, this, this one here represents a secondary tier of, of um, testing that if the victim uh, scratched or came into rough contact with the suspect um, and then there's an indication that maybe under those areas there might be some debris hopefully some skin cells from the suspect uh, then we would ask that the nurse swab underneath those swab underneath those fingernails and then we would retain that and and then test it So the, as you can see, there's quite a few envelopes and a lot of different evidence that's included in this box. And hopefully, as I've talked, I've given you an idea of the complexity of, of the testing. Now we're transitioning to reference standard samples. Um, when we test these swabs, we're, if you can think of us developing all of these complicated DNA profiles and the scientist needs to make heads or tails of whose profile belongs to whom. So one of the first things we need to be able to do is, is to determine what's the victim's DNA profile so we, can, so we can subtract out that victim's DNA from the background and then focus, be able to focus on, on the putative perpetrator. So what we ask the nurses to do is to take a buckle swab of the victim's cheek. So it's kind of like a cheek swab. Buckle, buccal, however you want to pronounce that. It's just a swabbing of the inside of the mouth and then place that into a cardboard container. And uh, what we'll do is we'll test that sample, determine what sample that uh, that is, and then that way um, we can make sure that um, we can focus again on the putative perpetrator. The next sample is the consent partner sample. So sometimes if the victim has had consensual sex uh, with uh, an individual, uh, there will be two types of sperm there. You'll have the putative perpetrator and then you'll have the consent partner. And we want to be able to distinguish between those two because um, at some point uh, a profile will be uploaded into the database. And also if the suspect, um, if, if the police have a suspect that they're looking at, we want to make sure that we don't, um, we don't get sidetracked looking at a consent partner sample um, and thinking that that might be the, the, the suspect sample. So uh, again, similar to the victim's buckle swab sample, we need that consent partner sample. And in Utah here, in, in our discussions, we've, we've come to realize that um, many times that the consent partner is with the victim during the SANE nurse exam. And so we've asked the nurses to, while they're there, to please 
collect that sample from the consent partner so we can have it right up front and get that testing done right when we do the kit because that makes the process a lot faster if we have all the all the samples that we need at the time of analysis um, that speeds up our testing and uh, can help us to get that information of an investigative report to the police department as soon as possible sometimes though the consent partner is not there and so that delays our testing um, and our ultimate report until we get that consent partner sample uh, sometimes uh, it, it, that'll slow up the process so we ask that those consent partner samples get um, submitted to us as soon as possible now we're moving to head hair samples uh, again we take those samples uh, so that if we do come across a foreign hair, uh, foreign head hair, wherever on either the the um, so the victim's clothing or in their pubic areas or anywhere that the seeing nurse examiner might see some trace evidence and we consider hair or fibers part of that trace hair. We ask them to go ahead and, and collect a sample for comparison um, uh, from the victim so that that we can we can distinguish it later on so that we since the sample is there right now we might as well just go ahead and, and collect it and and so we can have it for reference same idea for the pubic hair sample collect those samples keep it so that uh, we can use that uh, that sample to um, for reference collections um, later on finally we have uh, the blood samples now um, the blood sample, we don't really collect those anymore. It's just more from, um, from the past uh, when we used to require a blood sample, um, at least for, for DNA purposes. Uh, the only uh, blood sample that might be collected now would be a gray top tube, which would be to uh, test to determine whether or not there's any alcohol or any other um, any other types of drugs in the victim's bloodstream. Those samples are collected external to the kit, so they're not included in the kit anymore. Um, but uh, I just wanted to put that out there that the modern kits now don't have it, but they're collected separately so that we can so that we can get it to the toxicology lab sooner. Uh, but I also mentioned it there because some of the um, untested, unsubmitted kits from the past that if we're going back. And testing some of these some of these older kits, they may have a blood sample in there. So I just wanted to make that uh, make everyone aware of that. All right, uh, now just evaluating the evidence. Just some quick thoughts here. Uh, we've adopted kind of a triage process in Utah. It's called the UQuick process, where we test three unknown swabs plus the reference samples. And by allowing us to do that, um, that speeds up the process so we can get that investigative report to the officer as soon as possible. Part of our thinking on that is um, if we, instead of just testing everything, which would slow us down, if we focus on those relevant samples up, up front, uh, there's a greater chance of having speed and getting that case resolve faster so we test those up front um, at least at the starting point to see if we can solve it and what we've seen nationwide is that those agencies that have adopted this process are able to resolve uh, almost uh, 90 percent or greater of those cases um, up front now uh, we realize that there's probably you know seven to ten percent of those cases where we're going to have to go back and test other items of evidence that might be the panties that might be clothing that might be other items so we recognize that. The other stra uh, uh, time saving feature that we've done in, in Utah is we've eliminated the conventional serology and that's sperm identification. So it used to be that the sample would come in, we would test the swab to see if there was sperm on it and or if, if it was probative to identify blood, that's what we would do. We've eliminated that just for speed and now what we've done is we, we, we keep the sample so that if it's um, relevant for court or there's a question about the body fluid uh, identification, we can go back and test it. But what we've decided to do is eliminate this step and go straight to DNA. So when, what, what we, by doing that, it speeds up our process. Again, we're all about 
speed and efficiency and getting those reports back to the case investigators so that we can resolve the case faster. Now, one of the first things I mentioned when I started talking about these cases is our focus is on resolving the case. That is solving the case and getting a putative perpetrator identified fast. So I place this slide up here because um, what this indicates is there's other evidence other than DNA. And uh, I know people focus a lot on the DNA, but um, I want people to be aware of that uh, fingerprints and palm prints and footwear and trace evidence, including fibers and roots of hair and other types of evidence uh, need to be considered because um, sometimes I've found that there's a rush to just um, say, for instance, swab a fingerprint for DNA when that fingerprint could give us the identity of the putative perpetrator. So I caution people to rush to DNA. I say, think about every case that you're doing. Think about your evidence uh, before you make um, any sort of uh, decisions. Uh, and of course, the crime laboratory remains available for consultation and uh, or, um, you know, uh, we'd be happy to sit down and talk about each case circumstance. Um, one of the things that uh, we, you know, we talked about was um, kind of the different tiered levels of, of testing on that kit. And that first tier is starting with intimate samples. And then if that is negative, we move on to like the panties and then the fingernail swabbings and then the trace evidence. And then gradually we just kind of keep expanding to, to clothing into the crime scene. And maybe in the crime scene we look at bedding and we look at clothing and move out. We just keep kind of expanding outward. And that's kind of where this slide fits in, is expanding outwards to, to making sure that, that we, we don't miss anything, that we consider, consider the case in its entirety. And uh, to, to think of there are multiple ways to solve a case, even if we don't have DNA. So keep an open mind, keep a thought process open, and, and don't forget about um, the other criminalistic areas. Okay, so <clears throat> now we're talking about sexual assault kit storage. Um, some of the challenges with that is that right now um, we've decided that we're going to kind of keep kits forever, or for a long time anyway. And that kind of prevents, presents a little bit of a challenge. One of the things that we need to do is we need to keep that evidence sealed uh, and it needs to be kept cool and it needs to be kept dry. If, um, if not, then you, you end up having uh, degradation of those samples. But the good news is DNA is very stable, so it really takes a lot to compromise those samples. But for instance, if you've got moisture, uh, like say water leaks into the kit and it's allowed to mold, uh, that could be a problem. So as long as it's kept cool and dry, uh, you'll be able to test DNA samples for, for, for many, many years. I think law enforcement is going to be challenged in the future as depending on the size of the agency as these kits are collected and kept for you know many, many years, you're going to have lots and lots of samples and lots and lots of kits that grow over the years. So this is going to be a challenge for law enforcement trying to figure out how do we contain these, how do we store these things for long term. Um, that's just something in the future. Evidence themselves, uh, retention of the samples. I think um, one of the one of the practices that the crime laboratory has is when a, when a kit comes into the laboratory and we test it, and if we have a positive result, we're going to take that swab, place it into a packet, and we're going to keep it at the crime laboratory. Now, that's a good thing because that sort of guarantees the long-term storage of the most probative, probative sample possible for, for law enforcement. Um, and for the future.
and so that's that's a good thing now the challenge will be multiple years down the line of us keeping all of these swabs there'll be a little bit of a challenge for us to 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 store that um, and so there might be some of the issues but I bring this up because I think people realize or aren't really understanding the process so that if there's a indication that maybe a kit has been destroyed that might be okay that might not that might not compromise the case because the crime lab has kept the most probative part and that is the swabs and so it's not necessarily needed to keep keep the kit even though in legislation we do have that written in that you must keep the kit just understanding the process that we have the swabs at the crime lab it's kind of like a fail safe uh, situation so uh, that's it for this uh, webinar if you have any questions um, my name is Jay Henry and uh, I put up my email address jhenry at utah.gov so feel free to reach out to me uh, with any questions and uh, hopefully this has been a good webinar for you to learn a bit more about what the crime laboratory does.